Welcome to DM Neurology Made Easy. Today is the sixth episode of Fine Neurophilia Quick Revision Series. Let's see Dementia Part One. But what I am planning to do is to make you uh, read Harrison and Bradley as far as possible. So and also uh, will like you to clear some uh, concepts in dementia so that it it's easy for you to read dementia and understand it in a better way. So uh, let's start this dementia module. how many quest, uh, neurons are there in the cerebrum of the human brain so this is a tricky question mind bending question uh, so with this i wanted to introduce you to the intricacies of the brain and how the brain is functioning so carefully answer the question you know that in stroke about 1.2 million neurons 1.2 million not billion 1.2 million neurons are actually get uh, getting damaged each minute so how many total neurons are there in the cerebrum of human brain number of neurons in the human brain is amounting to about 85 billion and uh, of which about 15 billion are present in the cerebrum and about 70 billion are present in the cerebellum so cerebellum has about five times uh, neurons as in the cerebrum that is in the telencephalon and you should know that uh, this brain has got neurons as well as other cells that is non neuron cells non neuron cells will include microglia that will include the oligodendroglia the astrocytes the ependocyte ependymal ependal ependymal cells etc and of which each neuron has got about 15000 synapses the importance of these numericals is that one neuron gets about 15000 synapses and this is concerned with the uh, this synaptogenesis is concerned with the memory formation or the what we con- we are concerned with the cognition so that is importance of cognition so each thing we learn we listen to this uh, lecture so some synapses are being formed and each synapses uh, each neuron produces about 15000 synapses uh, to form a uh, memory or a information and uh, which gets encoded and gets uh, tra- fixed in within the brain so that was the first question you had and uh, this was uh, actually from the data so uh, if you read harrison you will uh, know all kinds of diseases uh, reg- affecting the brain especially in dementia if you read you will see alzheimer's disease frontotemporal dementia etc etc but uh, i would like to say that you should ha- get to know some uh, functioning of the brain that is the functionality of the brain before you get to know about the diseases so in the first class of stroke we learned that about the broadman's uh, area that is uh, the functional small functional areas within the brain which are uh, located uh, within the brain which has a specific function so broadman divided into 52 areas so like that grossly Uh, functional areas are also there within the brain for cognition also so let's just see how you can you try to answer this uh, question hope you can see the poll so uh, this was about a 56 year old female uh, who presented with difficulty in cooking she was ap- apparently normal then later she developed difficulty in cooking she was unable to collect necessary ingredients for cooking so for example a curry or sambar or khichdi so and she was unable to judge the quantity correctly add the ingredients in sequence and was unable to set the uh, breakfast which was supposed to be set by about 10 am she was able to set only by uh, afternoon and uh, she was uh, not allowed to go to the kitchen after the, she was found to be grossly unable to uh, f- function in that way and what is this dis- dysfunction and where will you localize this uh, problem to so whether is it, is it a problem in the frontal lobe the temporal lobe the parietal lobe or the occipital lobe grossly that will be the uh, first question i'll be asking you but i have made it a bit tough so that i'll uh, uh, with this question i will be able to uh, help explain to you how how this functions so she is unable to do uh, things in sequence so this is actually a executive dysfunction and executive dysfunction is a dysfunction of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex so if you grossly see the functionality of the brain uh you can see this is the frontal lobe that is anterior to the central sulcus and posterior is the parietal and this between below the uh, sylvian sulcus is the temporal lobe which is concerned mainly with the memory 
parietal is associated with the visuo spatial function these are not clear cut areas they have they are actually interconnect interconnected areas so they have function uh, the they are there is intermixing of the functions actually and occipital is as you know is concerned with the vision but this is actually uh, further as we had seen in the broadman's area we have just uh, i put this slide so that you just revise through all these which we had studied during the stroke because these are repeat questions which comes every time so gross functionality was described by luria he said that every input which comes to the brain comes through the brain stem that is the block 1 you see here the block 1 the block 1 which includes the reticular activating system which is present in the brain stem which is processed by the block 2 which is includes the temporal parietal and the occipital lobe which the area gets encoded and then what to do with these inputs is decided by the frontal lobe which acts on it so this is the luria's three functional blocks uh, which we see so uh, some questions are there in aims question which came regarding the luria uh, luria actually uh, had dealt with mainly the frontal lobe functions so luria had done uh, test with luria's fist edge palm test or the luria sequencing test was done uh, is mainly done for frontal lobe function and frontal lobe anatomy as you know is primary motor cortex that is the uh, motor cortex then there is a premotor area supplementary motor area frontal area so and prefrontal area is further we have the dorsal dorsal pre, uh, dorsal prefrontal cortex orbito frontal cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex so if you see the cross section like this this is the dorsal prefrontal cortex and this is the me medial prefrontal cortex and this is the orbital prefrontal so dorsal is associated with the executive function and if something goes wrong in that as we had seen in our patient the patient gets the dis executive function dis executive syndrome and if there is something wrong with the mesial side or the medial side the patient has decreased motivation remember m for m so motivation motivation is lost and the patient becomes apathetic and that form uh, the patient gets an apathetic syndrome and orbito frontal patient gets disinhibitive syndrome so that patient will be having a behavioral disturbance social uh, problems and will be having a impulsive kind of behavior so remember like this dorsal means medial and orbito frontal so every part so i have just described the frontal part frontal lobe for you so you uh, similarly you have to somehow try to learn regarding the memory the apraxia agnosia some connections regarding alexia etc etc are there which are actually uh, would be asked in the institute exams basically rather than in the uh, neat exam and uh, we'll in the advanced class we'll try to touch upon a few points but before starting the topic proper i thought i should uh, tell you regarding the importance of these topics let's see what dementia is so dementia uh, is actually the word meaning is actually madness or insanity so that is why dsm 5 classification has changed the term from dementia to what is called as a major cognitive disorder so what is major cognitive disorder is, is actually memory impairment with some other domains getting affected and which affects our activities of daily living so the memory impairment if it doesn't affect our activities of daily living it is otherwise called as mild neurocognitive disorder so the term dementia is not uh, now uh, clinically used in classification it is actually called as major neurocognitive disorder so this is actually the term the, so the memory impairment is there and if we, along with it one more area is getting affected either aphasia apraxia disturbance in executive function which cannot be explained by delirium or any psychiatric or medical issues and which definitely affects the activities of daily living so activities of daily living will include the social and occupational thing so such a thing will is now termed as dementia or major neurocognitive impairment so this degenerative diseases the most common one this is a very frequently asked question the most common uh, degenerative disease is actually the alzheimer's disease followed by dementia second most common is uh, dementia with lewy body 
and then comes the vascular cognitive uh, impairment and then FTD. So if you see uh, the part of the brain, if you see this, as we had seen, we have to study all the parts. We had just touched upon the frontal area. In Alzheimer's disease, actually, there is impairment of the temporal initially, followed by parietal and frontal part. And in frontal temporal dementia, as the name indicates itself, there is frontal first followed by temporal. And in the diffuse Lewy body disease, diffuse, the name itself says diffuse. So there is diffuse involvement of uh, brain with even involvement of occipital lobe, diffuse Lewy body disease. And in case of posterior cortical atrophy variant of Alzheimer's disease, we have involvement of occipital lobe first. So this is actually uh, selective involvement of certain areas of the brain are important in differentiating certain diseases of uh, cert uh, certain types of dementia. So this was uh, what I was telling in frontal temporal dementia and Alzheimer's disease, both of them, we have involvement of frontal and temporal regions. But as we can see here in frontal temporal dementia, there is more of frontal involvement than the temporal involvement. And in temporal in Alzheimer's disease, there is more of temporal involvement rather than the frontal involvement. And uh, as we see, this is a case of corticobasal degeneration. In, we can, in this, we can see there is asymmetric uh, cortical involvement along with there is basal involvement. And this is a case of vascular dementia. We can see white matter involvement and there is atrophy. So that part is actually uh, pulled in, pulled out, pulled in actually because of atrophy to that area. So uh, with uh, actually this aging, aging also there is dementia. Then we have discussed regarding mild cognitive impairment. Then comes the dementia or the major cognitive impairment. So this is actually a continuum. So what is difference in um, normal aging, MCI, that is mild cognitive impairment and major cognitive impairment. So uh, any, uh, let's uh, try to answer this question. So in aging, this actually ha has been taken from Harrison. Uh, so whether with aging, general knowledge and vocabulary remains stable or it improves, problem solving and reasoning will decline. Uh, age related decline occurs uh, primarily in speed, working memory and encoding. There is decline in learning acquisition performance with delayed recall, uh, severity affected. So first three sentences are actually typical of what we see in case of a age related degeneration age delay, age related memory impairment but the third sentence if you see the first part of the third sentence is actually correct first part of the third sentence says, says that there is actually a decline in the learning and acquisition performance that's true but in, what happens is delayed recall is not severely affected it's actually preserved but in alzheimer's disease this delayed recall is actually affected first so if you tell a few numbers and ask to uh, uh, tell after about uh, two minutes or three minutes uh, in case of age related they may be able to tell but in case of uh, alzheimer's disease it will be affected very early so that is the difference in case of normal aging versus uh, alzheimer's disease so these are each lines are been taken from harrison and this can be uh, this are uh, easily can be made into a question so in this is a repeat question uh, in mca memory loss becomes uh, actually when we do a standardized memory test what when will you call it a mca that is my minimal or mild cognitive impairment so it is actually 1.5 uh, standard uh, deviation so the, this is actually importance of the concept of minimal cognitive impairment so before the patient can be termed as a uh, major cognitive impairment or patient getting dementia there is a entity called minimal cognitive impairment and also and uh, this is actually in between term that is in between uh, normal cognition and major cognitive impairment and it has actually two types that is amnestic variety and an anamnestic variety so amnestic variety as the name itself suggests is actually impairment in the memory and anamnestic is without impairment in the memory so i have answered this question so i i don't think there is a need of poll for this question so the criteria for this uh, 
anamnestic MCI include uh, impairment all the ex domains except. So criteria for anamnestic MCI include impairment of all the following except. So you know the answer I have discussed. That is two types of MCI are there. That is mild cognitive impairment. That is anamnestic and amnestic. So what we are asking in this question, what is this anamnestic MCI criteria and what doesn't include under this? So actually memory includes is included under amnestic MCA and not under an amnestic MCA. Amnestic MCA, that is the memory memory MCA. I, I will like you to remember as a mem memory MCA actually progresses into Alzheimer's disease. And the anamnestic, non-amnestic or anamnestic MCA progresses into the other types of uh, dementias like frontotemporal dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies. So usually about MCA patients, by a, every year, about 10 to 15 percentage, they have a risk of developing into either categories, either Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementias. Each of these can be framed into questions so that you learn the concept very thoroughly. Next question is in 1906, a German psychiatrist described uh, regarding uh, a patient in a psychiatric unit for her uh, and described Alzheimer's disease in that patient. And uh, it was described in a woman named on which patient we had asked the um, in on which patient is uh, this the disease described on so let's see i have put each each person each name uh, here actually has got it, uh, his or her or importance in the field of cognition so the answer is actually agastya editor about 60 percentage of them have correct, given the correct answer so I'll tell you that this uh, lady was actually uh, admitted in a psychiatry asylum, asylum mental asylum, and uh, uh, Alois Alzheimer's uh, had diagnosed Alzheimer's disease. He was actually a neuropathologist. He actually described Alzheimer's disease in this patient. And who was Mesulam? Mesulam was the one who had described the progressive aphasias. You have heard about logopenic variant of aphasia, primary progressive variant, uh, that is the semantic variant of aphasia, non-fluent variant of aphasia, all were described by Mesulam. And who is this Louis Vector Libogne? So as we had described about, about Agastya Ditter, she was a patient. Louis Victor Libogne was also a patient. He was actually a patient of our uh, Paul Broca. So Broca described uh, the Broca's area was described first in actually Louis Victor Libogne. This patient could only tell the word Tan. So his nickname was Tan. And uh, he had actually right-sided weakness. So uh, this patient, uh, this actually uh, Louis had right-sided weakness and could only tell the word Tan. And Broca knew that he had no much of a cognitive decline, but could only express the word Tan. And with this, Broca was interviewed. He looked after this patient. And when the patient died, autopsy was done and was found that the patient was having a frontal lobe tumor. And Broca found out that actually this tumor in the Broca's area had caused actually the patient to have a Broca's aphasia. And that is why the patient was able to tell only a single word and that was Tan. So this is Alois Alshima, uh, who was a German psychiatrist who described Alshima's disease with its pathology, that is neuronal loss flakes and tangles on Agastya Ditter. So as we know, the Alzheimer's disease uh, right now, it's actually a clinical diagnosis, but now lots of studies are going on and lots of questions are coming regarding the biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease. So uh, this is actually a commonly asked question. A person with biomarker evidence of Alzheimer's disease, that is amyloid Im imaging is positive, PET is positive, uh, there is A beta 2 decrease, elevated tau, and there is no symptoms. What will we call this patient? This patient is called prodromal lady. This I had taken uh, from actually the Harrison. So this is actually prodromal lady. So actually early symptomatic AD and MCA are actually similarly overlapping terms. In early symptomatic AD and MCA, if you test the patient, actually the patient uh, will be uh, normal and the uh, patient will have some abnormality that is about 1.5 standard deviation we had described described in the previous question but he will be functionally compensated compensated that is his activities of daily living will be normal 
but in prodromal ad there is nothing wrong with the patient except that when he was uh, worked up he found was found to be having a uh, biomarker for alzheimer's disease that is regarding this concept and regarding the genetics of alzheimer's disease let's try to solve this question all you know is actually apoe4 allele is increases the risk of alzheimer's disease so if you have a single allele it increases the risk from 2 to 3 fold so if you have both the alleles how many fold will the risk increase whether it's 4 fold 8 fold 16 fold or 32 fold uh, it is actually 16 fold i'll share a few facts regarding uh, E4 allele. So E4 allele are notorious or a common risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So there are other alleles also. There is E3 allele and E2 allele. And out of which E2 allele, E2 allele is found to be protective. E2 allele is found to be protective, but E4 allele is actually destructive for ca in case of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, which of the following is the most common uh, cause of early onset Alzheimer's disease? Is it amyloid precursor protein? Is it presenilin 1? Is it presenilin 2? Or is it ApoE gene? All will be happy seeing the question. Most of them will be having the answer in their mind. They can just shoot the answer. So we have always see the question properly. It's not actually simple Alzheimer's disease or late onset Alzheimer's disease. We are asking regarding early onset Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so the answer is actually uh, presenilin 1. So early onset Alzheimer's disease has actually more of a genetic cause uh, rather than uh, if it was a common Alzheimer's disease, ApoE would be, have been an answer. This is a common area of MCQs. More, lots of MCQs comes in this area. So don't miss this uh, concept. So uh, see this chart properly. Learn all these chromosomes also. So chroma chromosome 21 is uh, responsible for amyloid precursor protein. Uh, 14 for presenilin 1, 1 for presenilin 2, 19 is responsible for ApoE. And uh, most common cause of Alzheimer's, always remember it is actually ApoE. There is no doubt regarding that. In case of early onset, remember actually it is presenilin uh, 1. So presenilin 1 will be most common. That is in the chromosome 14. So don't forget that uh, fact. Uh, and check the question always when that uh, kind of question is asked. So that was regarding genetics of AAD. There is also more, more advanced genetics, even in Harrison, some new advanced genetics regarding uh, Alzheimer's disease are described. For example, I'll tell you one question regarding TREM2 mutation is there. And uh, one disease called Nasu Hakola, Hakola disease is there. Uh, you don't think that it's very rare and all. We recently had a patient with uh, this kind of TREM2 mutation positive in our hospital. So that's when I realized that all these things in Harrison are not just uh, facts or this hi-fi stuff. It can be true also. So that's why these questions come. So such an examiner gets uh, such kind of patient in his uh, clinics or in his OPD or in his IP, then that question comes in the next exam. So be careful about that. So uh, that's why I told you that. And, uh, Regarding this basic concept, atrophy in amnestic Alzheimer's disease begins initially at uh, which part? So I think uh, all should get this answer correct. Uh, make sure you read, take time to read your question because one minute would have been allotted for you to read the question. So this is a simple question. Nobody should lose marks on. Yes, actually 86 percentage have got the answer correctly. It's actually medial temporal uh, region, which is the first area to get affected. So uh, as you see, there is atrophy of the medial temporal uh, region and there is widening of the ventricle in this region. And further, there is shrinkage of the cortex. Uh, these are all basic basic things in, in MBBS or MD level you would have studied. So why this happens, we'll learn in the subsequent. So this class is basically to solve this concept.